Good evening, councillors, officers, members of the public that may be joining us via the webcast this evening. I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, meeting of the Strategic Planning, Sustainability and Transportation Committee uh, today, Tuesday the 11th of July 2017. I'll start with the usual housekeeping, if I may. Um, we're not anticipating a fire alarm this evening, so if it does sound, please remain seated to enable Ms. Tunnicliffe to assess the situation and give further instructions on the evacuation of the building if necessary. And I'd like to remind you all that tonight's proceedings will be webcast by the Council, but if anyone else intends to record, please can you let me know now? And I ask this not to stop you, but merely to make others aware that this is taking place. And I see that nobody indicates their intention to record. So with that done, we can move to the agenda item one. Apologies for absence. I have received apologies for Councillor Wilby. Councillor Mrs. Gush? Yes, I have apologies from Councillor Steve Munford. Thank you, and that is duly noted, which will probably move me nicely on to agenda item two, notif oh, Councillor English. If the meeting does continue after a quarter to eight, I will have to leave because there is a residence consultation on the Union Street development. I do need to go for at least some time. That is understood and duly noted. So if I may now move to item two, substitute members. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Gooch for Councillor Steve Munford. Again, that is noted. Item three, urgent items. I would like to draw your attention to um, a small update document which is presented in connection with item 15. It was circulated earlier, and I believe you may have it on your desk. Okay, we'll, we'll pass that around now, but it's just some additional information in relation to agenda item 15. And if you wish, I'll give you a moment to consider that just before the item. Visiting members, may I make a note of visiting members? Councillor Perry, it looks like it may just be you this evening. Story of my life, yeah. Um, agenda item, uh, is Councillor Perry for agenda item 13, park and ride? Thank you. Thank you. Members and officers, are there any disclosures that you wish to make? I see that nobody indicates and therefore none are noted. And similarly, I'm going to ask you on agenda item six, are there any disclosures of lobbying tonight? Many shaketh of heads, none noted. Item seven, um, we'll consider whether any item should be taken in private because of possible disclosure of exempt information. We have no yellow papers this evening. Um, I therefore propose that there will be no two part two items unless we consider it necessary at that stage. Is that agreed, members? Thank you. Next, if we might turn to agenda item eight, the minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of June, 2017, circulated with the papers, and I trust you've all had time to examine them. Councillor English. Members may recall when we discussed the um, report uh, in relation to air quality and low emission strategy, I did not mention the issue of uh, the air quality working group and it was decided that although it, the continuation of such group did not need to be added to the resolution, that a note would be made on the minutes that it, the relevant members and the chairman would be taking the action to continue it as appropriate. Does that amendment that's what have, we said at the have consensus? Okay, I'll take that as an amendment. Are there any further amendments or corrections that anybody would like to make? I think not. Um, I think it also correct just to advise you that I did receive correspondence from Headcorn asking that the minutes might be reconsidered. Um, they were concerned that our resolution was not specific about returning to Regulation 14. Um, I have examined that matter, and I do believe that um, the minutes show the correct words for the resolution that we did actually pass. Um, so I just wanted to draw that to your attention, but I do not believe that we need a specific amendment. 
Councillor English. Uh, unless I've completely misunderstood what they were actually arguing at the last meeting, I thought they didn't want us to refer to, to going back to Regulation 14, so this minute is completely and utterly what they actually <laughs> said. Well, well I, I think the minutes reflect the true record of the meeting. Yeah, okay. So, barring the amendment from Councillor English, may I take the minutes as a, a, a true record and sign them accordingly? Is that agreed? Thank you. Item 9, concerning petitions. There are no petitions this evening. And item 10, concerning questions. There are no questions presented to us this evening. Item 11, um, an opportunity just to update on any activities directly relating to this committee but outside of our normal meetings, Councillor English. Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, thank you. The Chairman and I attended a seminar um, on low emission vehicles in London and also the use of those vehicles for generation purposes, which was reasonably interesting, although perhaps not as much as I'd hoped. But it, it did indicate uh, that we do need to give great attention to the issue of electric vehicles. So we're on the right course there. And the only other thing that's happened, Mr Chairman, is that today uh, <clears throat> that the uh, Community Rail Partnership was discussing the process of meeting with the four bidders for the South Eastern Rail franchise. Thank you for that update. Um, in connection with the meeting that Councillor English and I attended, there are some presentation slides that contain some useful information. Would members like to receive a copy of those, give some background information? Okay, I'll ask the uh, clerk to forward that to everyone. Councillor Willis. Um, we went to a meeting of the Medway Valley Rail Partnership before the one you referred to but since the last meeting, and they asked whether they can be a consultee on the uh, bus stop challenge. The town centre bus, whatever it's called, yeah, do you know what I mean? Mr. Egerton, would you like to just confirm the bus, our correct um, understanding the of the request? Uh, I, I, I would say yes. Um, if you were, if Councillor Wills would be happy to, I'd be happy to take that on board if Councillor Wills would pass their details. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That's all duly recorded. Can I draw our attention now to agenda item 12, the committee work programme, um, to be found on page 8. This is really just for noting. Councillor Mrs Pendergrast. Chairman, at the last meeting, Councillor Wilby and I raised several items that had disappeared, and it was agreed that they would be added back on. And this is minuscule writing, but I can see that parks and open spaces is missing, the general permitted development rights is missing. Can we just get this right once and for all so we don't have to keep checking month in, month out, and requesting that they be added back on, please. Thank you. I can answer on, um, park, on parks and open spaces in terms of the green and blue infrastructure uh, action plan should be coming back to this committee in October. Okay, we'll make sure that those other items are picked up on, picked up on and included. Councillor Willis, then Councillor English. I don't know what the procedure is for this, but um, in the uh, works programme, which is what we're, we're on here, yeah, um, could there be a review of bus priority measures or bus enhancements across Maidstone, holistically? Perhaps, Nick, after that, Christmas. That's a very broad-ranging request that perhaps will be picked up in other items on the work programme. With regard to submitting requests for agenda items, what I would request is that if you put those in an email to me with a fairly um, specific outline of what you want to achieve, then um, the Vice Chair and I can consider that at the agenda setting meeting next. Councillor English, were you wanting to yeah, speak again? Um, <clears throat> obviously, there are, there are a number of items to be confirmed. Um, 
some of which were sort of shoveled in, I'm not quite sure why, but, but because of issues were placed into the planning review. Obviously, once the planning review is uh, dealt with, hopefully, I would like to see the 20 mile an hour, for example, brought back into the program. I'm not proposing a date now, but <clears throat> if that was delayed, along with the transport users group issue, because of the issue of resources and, and the planning review, once we're clear on that, I would like those brought back. And the other thing is, um, I know this is a somewhat unusual request and possibly a bit selfish, but the public art and public realm policies are coming to the meeting, second meeting in September, which is the one meeting this year I'm not going to be able to do, and I have a particular interest in those. Um, is, there, is that definite, or is there any chance of, of, of moving that to the next meeting after that? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am happy to have a word with those uh, concerns and, uh, and see if we can get that moved to, uh, to October. Thank you. Again, we'll consider all of that at the uh, agenda setting in conjunction with the Vice Chair. Final word, Councillor Willis. On it's this a really one. quick one, but um, I heard a rumour through the Cycle Forum that there's a £10,000 budget towards launching the Thames KTC have towards launching the Thames towpath scheme. Um, if that is correct, and we, Colin Finch has left post so we don't know, if that is correct, could we bring that forward as an urgent, get an urgent report to his committee so it's best spent or not? Again, I'd ask you to, to put that in an email so that it doesn't get neglected. Mr Egerton, do you want to just mention something? Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, I, I would just draw members' attention to, to another item um, which hasn't been presented to uh, this committee. Um, on Friday, we received notification from Ashford Borough Council, and that regards their Regulation 19 local plan consultation. Um, that consultation is on main changes, as they've referred to it, from their old Regulation 19 consultation. So basically, they produced a draft local plan, and now, and that was consulted on back in June last year. What they're proposing now is main changes to that local plan and they're required by statute to do a further period of public consultation and we're involved in that. Um, unfortunately, the consultation period which does, did start uh, on Friday uh, finishes on the 31st of August and there isn't a, a, an sps &T meeting um, to decide on our response uh, before that uh, date. Um, there's a few issues which I think we should be addressing immediately from a very cursory glance at it, um, which uh, deals with sort of sites and allocations and for housing and so forth, and uh, the basis of objectively assessed need. I have to say straight away that it looks like they're trying to accommodate their need within their borough boundary, so from that point of view there's at least some reassurance. But I think we need to give it further attention. Officers themselves will obviously endeavour to send a response to this consultation, but there are obviously uh, options when it comes to member involvement. Um, officers, I think, would offer that we send a written draft to members of this committee uh, for consideration before it's sent, given that there won't be an SPS and until the end of September, which could consider it. But I'll leave that for the committee. Thank you. So I think that's very familiar territory to us, a process that we've ourselves recently undergone. Um, the timing of this doesn't suit our um, work program. Officers do have delegated powers under our constitution to make the responses on our behalf. Um, so I would recommend that we take the officer's um, offer that he circulates a draft response to us and perhaps add to that that should there be any um, contentious differentiation of views then perhaps in collaboration with the chair and vice chair we would arbitrate the response. I'll take Councillor Mrs Gooch first and then Councillor English. Apologies Chairman, I'm a little bit deaf this evening. You did say Tunbridge and Malling and not Tunbridge Wells or have I got it run the wrong way? <laughs> I'm totally wrong. It was Ashford. I'm glad I checked. Thank you so much. I do apologise. I think that's very telling to us all that we're at a remarkably advanced stage with our plan whilst on eastern, western, northern fronts all around us the furore is um, yet continuing. Um, so anyway, that's the, the way forwards with that. If there's... Oh, Councillor English, you wanted to... Um, Mr. Edgerton, you referred to the previous uh, con 
earlier stage of consultation by Ashford Borough Council, which I, I think we responded to. Um, in order to assist uh, members uh, in dealing with, with the, uh, this response, would it be possible to circulate along with your response to this, the actual original um, response, because it could be useful in, in terms of seeing what's changed? Uh, thank you very much. Very good. So if we can leave that item there and we'll next move on to agenda item 13. Um, this is the report findings thus far in relation to park and ride and, and Ms. Hawkes will assist us with this. Thank you, Chairman. The park and ride service has been reviewed um, over the previous months as it's an area for, of large spend for the council. And there's currently an, an assumption in the efficiency plan that um, £75,000 will be saved from the budgets. And that could be from additional income or savings in the cost of running the service. And the current, con the current contract has been extended by a year to enable the review to be carried out. The park and ride service itself costs about 584,000 to run and generates an income of 342,000. So the net cost to the council is about 242,000 and 218,000 of this is met by the civil parking enforcement fund. Uh, the review itself looked at the operational future and shorter term future of park and ride and was carried out to be complementary to the separate and longer term tri-study work that's currently being carried out and will be reported back to this committee in October. Um, the review itself um, looked at how well um, park and ride contributed to the integrated transport strategy and whether it provided value for money and the um, full uh, the full objectives of the review are set out at um, 2.9 in the report. Lots of work has been carried out over, uh, over the months, including financial analysis, stakeholder engagement, analysis of budgets um, and user data, best practice research, and a survey with both users and non-users of Park and Ride that was um, really um, uh, well taken on board and we had over, um, well we had nearly, I should say, uh, one and a half thousand responses which we were really happy with. The key findings are actually detailed in the report um, uh, between sections uh, 2.12 and 2.20 and are summarised um, in the conclusions uh, section at 2.21 and to 2.28. Um, and the next steps are there too, the next steps that will need to, be, need to be taken as a result of the findings. So if I can draw members' attention to the uh, conclusion section itself. The park and ride service is highly valued by its users. That was clear from the results of the consultation. It's used by about 800 people every day, slightly more on weekends, sli sorry, slightly more on weekdays, slightly fewer on Saturdays. Uh, but it is only taking about 170 cars off the road at peak times on weekdays. Um, uh, and the buses currently are not of a high enough Euro standard to meet the aims of the Council's low emission strategy. Therefore, currently, the current service is not providing value for money for the 242,000 it costs the Council every year to run the service. Um, however, whilst Park and Ride isn't, isn't as successful as we would like in terms of delivering the objectives of the um, integrated transport strategy, in terms of reducing peak time, traffic congestion and improving air quality, we couldn't find as a result of this review any other option in terms of using the current assets and finances that actually contributed any better. Um, the service itself is already... <sighs> is already at a level that is lower than the majority of park and ride services offered by other councils. So um, a bus runs from each site every 20 minutes. Uh, the majority of other councils will run somewhere between 8 and 15 minutes. So the frequency is lower than uh, the majority of other councils. And it, will, and it finishes earlier than, again, the majority of the services provided by other councils. So it's difficult to see where we could cut the service any more to enable savings to be made. Um, however, 
the opportunity to make the service potentially better value for money comes um, when we look at fares. So about two-thirds of the um, uh, income that we get from fares is from off-peak and concessionary fares. And actually the council charges, what charges one of the lowest fares in the country. Um, the um, lowest we could find uh, was £1.50, so only 10p um, less than the council currently charges for an off-peak fare. Um, as a slight aside, in fact, a lot of councils don't actually separate their peak and off-peak fares. They charge a flat rate all day. Um, so um, at 2.19 in the report, we run through the details that um, financial analysis showed us, but essentially increasing the peak of the um, off-peak fare could generate substantial additional income. So for example, increasing the off-peak fare, prov fare provided that um, ticket sales stayed the same could generate an additional um, £37,000 a year. Making all fares £2.40, again, for example, so an increase in the off-peak fare and actually a decrease in the peak fare when we're trying to get people to travel could generate um, an additional £75,000, again, provided that ticket sales remained the same, didn't go up or down. That's what we'd expect to see something in the region of that. Um, we also had a look at a pay-to-park model, so um, is it better to uh, charge people to park in the car park and a free ride on the bus or charge them to ride the bus? Um, uh, most other councils do a pay-to-ride model, but there are some that do operate a pay-to-park pay model. For example, Canterbury does would be the nearest one to us. Um, that could also generate even higher levels of additional income, um, but it would be probably more risky in terms of loss of potential users. So, for example, um, uh, concessionary fares currently travel for free um, after 9.30? 9.30, 9.30, um, on the park and ride buses, um, but they may then incur a cost if we introduce a pay-to-ride scheme. Um, it's also important, obviously, that prices remain competitive in comparison to town centre car parks. Um, from the consultation, it does appear that a, offering a more frequent service that runs later in line with what most other councils offer from a park and ride service might well encourage more people to use park and ride, which would therefore better support the objectives of the integrated transport strategy and increase income. Um, in terms of our... Um, uh, when we spoke to potential suppliers, the uh, information we were given appears that a more frequent service maybe could be run without much more additional cost, but because of the congestion that the park and ride buses meet at certain peak times, it could impact on service, on punctuality and service quality in that way. Um, obviously, in terms of the park and ride buses, there are better quality buses out there. Euro 6 standard buses are the ideal and that could be built into um, any tender to ensure that the best and least polluting vehicles um, are used in terms of any future park and ride service. Um, in terms of the contract period itself, again speaking to the suppliers and using the knowledge of those in the service and the procurement team, uh, a longer contract period than we currently have, probably with about seven to ten years being the optimum, um, would encourage suppliers to invest in better buses and then the cost will be spread over a longer period, making the annual cost actually cheaper for the council. Um, We've done all this work, but without going out to tender for a new service, we can't say with certainty uh, whether a similar improved service, uh, um, how much, sorry, a similar improved service would cost in the future, and therefore, if it will provide value for money. Uh, therefore, it is necessary to go out to tender, and it is necessary to go out to tender in, ju in July to ensure that any future supplier has the sufficient time to get all the arrangements they need to get in place for the expiry of the current contract on the 31st of May. Uh, next year. Um, in the same vein, without more consultation with users and non-users of the service, it's difficult to say how if we made any changes to any charging structure that might impact the behaviour of both users and non-users. So will we have more people using it, will we have fewer people using it? And we need to do some more work around that. So in terms of the next steps we need to take, they're set out at um, point, uh, 2.28. Uh, which is number one, go out to tender in July and we will seek bids for a contract of approximately seven to ten years. Um, our offices are currently working on the tender documents at the moment and uh, the tender itself will explore service improvements and will um, build in the allowance for innovation from suppliers in terms of ideas they might have. 
Um, we'll also undertake further consultation with users and non-users to explore how changing park and ride charges and uh, potential changes in the service might change their behaviour and usage of park and ride and therefore how well it supports the integrated transport strategy. Um, the number three will be um, actually reporting back the tender results um, after stage one because we do have the potential to move to stage two um, which is a negotiation with, um, uh, with uh, potential suppliers or the bidders that come back. Um, so we would um, report those results back and the results of the consultation in October to coincide with the results of the tri study and that will be before any contract will be awarded to any new park and ride um, a supplier. So this will allow members to see the full picture in terms of um, what's been found from the TRI study um, in terms of the, um, the whole picture around transport in the longer term and uh, the cost of providing a park and ride and the service we can provide in the shorter term. Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Now. I think Councillor Perry, you'd indicated you wish you to address the committee on this. Would you like to do that now? Uh, thank you, Chairman, members. Um, when I read this report, I did find it a bit confusing, to be perfectly honest. Um, it talks about the recommendation is to note, which I understand, but then it talks about going out to tender. So I'm kind of confused about the, the, what it's really saying. The council has to make savings, we, we know that. And however one addresses this, this is a costly service. Is it an essential service? I'm not sure it is. What are the actual benefits to the town's economy? I was very intrigued by para 2.13, where it talks about the need for bus priorities, reallocation of road space, reduced availability of car parking or increased cost of parking in the town centre to make this work. I doubt if this would help the future of the town centre at all, quite frankly, which, let's face it, is under competition in itself. What I think we should be doing is providing more car parking, actually, and certainly from a rural perspective, if you come into Mayston, you're going to drive in a car. And okay, you might. Why would you need a park and ride service? I can't see it. And cars are not evil. I know it's fashionable to have a swipe at them, except, of course, when it suits us. Paragraph 2.13, I found very revealing. Very few councils like Mayston have these schemes. And if you actually look at the root structure of Maidstone, especially in the south and the east, to see that Maidstone really isn't suited at all. It's not like some towns in this country, like Oxford, where they are, the structure of the town actually does work for a park and ride. It doesn't really work here at all. So I'm very confused. It's already been said that this is um, not value for money. And uh, I've gained, and para 2.21 and 2.22 are hardly supportive in this paragraph if you actually read them. It seems to me that um, there's a view that we need park and ride, and it's a bit, I'm sorry to say, it's a bit like a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. You're trying to make the punishment fit the crime. You're trying to find evidence to support what you want to actually believe in. And I actually think we need to be a bit more sensible about this. Now, the one option that was said was about increasing fares, tariffs, and that obviously is a source of income. And I would have thought before committing ourselves to anything in the future, we should have tried and experiment just a little bit to see whether that might actually work. We might generate more income and we might actually bridge the, the deficit because that seems to me a, a rather crucial point. So really what I'm really saying here is I think this is all a bit premature. We should not be committing ourselves to anything until we have a lot more evidence and we can sort out whether a tariff system could actually work. Thank you. Thank you, members, and thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Perry. I see a number of indications. I shall start from my left and work anti-clockwise. Councillor de Wigenden, would you like to go first? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I actually feel this, this, this does um, raise lots of questions, but actually I, I largely agree with, with officers in that we, we need to 
actually start a tender and see what options we do have so we can have a proper look at the issues. I think, I think Councillor Perry made a, good, made a good suggestion about, you know, to see whether changing the fair structure works. Um, but I, I, I do think, and certainly with the time constraints that we have, um, I think we do need to, this to come back when we actually have some, some, some concrete, some concrete um, uh, proposals to look at. Likewise, we're talking about, you know, the, what, the, what uh, our, our, our preferred choice of vehicles would be and the, the, the top, the, the, the very best ones of those and, and the proposals that, you know, to see if they were realistic, that they would be actually revenue neutral or indeed actually make, a, make us a saving. I have one question. There was a, uh, 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 I wasn't, uh, I just wanted to get my head around. Um, we, we charge for the journey and there was a suggestion that you could charge for the parking. Now, for you charge for the journey, we get money from KCC for concessions, but if they, we were charging for parking, we wouldn't get that at all. So if we actually were charging for parking, we'd have a hundred grand extra hole in the, in the budget for that, wouldn't we? Well, uh, no, in terms of when we've done the financial modelling, no, it doesn't look that way. So we've taken into account the fact that we wouldn't get anything from KCC in terms of the um, concessionary fares. And we had to make some assumptions around how many people uh, were currently travelling in a car. Um, hence why that option is currently a bit more risky, just because we've had to make more assumptions than, we've had, than um, we had to with looking at the pay-to-ride model. But no, um, the um, figure given in the report of about £100,000 additional it could bring in uh, takes into account the fact that we wouldn't get any income from KCC. I was just because one of those points we were saying because a large proportion of these people are, are the more elderly people and therefore they're, they're currently not paying at all are they and so currently so 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 that would actually make, uh, represent quite a large difference in cost for them if they were using this the service. I just want my, my position is still clear I think like, we actually need I think this is very interesting. I don't have enough actual real, real, real detail, and I think we, we just agree with the officers. We need to go ahead and get some more detail. Thank you, Councillor De Wigginan. Councillor Mrs. Springer. Thank you. Um, it's not often that I disagree with Councillor Perry, but I do. Um, I am a supporter of Park and Ride. I think we need it. Um, if we close it, it doesn't matter how many, there will be more cars on the road. That, that is a fact. It may only be 80 or 90, but that's more adding to our congestion. So I think that's, that's a, a bad route to follow. However, I don't think we can keep allowing it to make a loss. So exploring ways of making it pay its way, I think, are, are paramount. Now, I noticed KCC, this concessions thing, I found a bit confusing. But they obviously pay us some money for allowing the, those with a bus pass to travel free. But technically we're subsidising them as well because they're not paying the normal fare. So we're subsidising the other 82p, yet it only affects part of the borough. Only people or the older person that lives near a park and ride benefits from this. So we're subsidising part of the community. Could I just throw an idea into the pot? It's obviously a very valuable service for the older generation, looking at the numbers. If we ask them to pay 50p for a return journey, on those numbers, that brings in £65,000. I'm sure it's a service they wouldn't want to lose. So if, they, if, if the risk is the service is going to be cancelled or closed, if it is marketed in the correct manner that in order to protect this service for you, we are asking for a 50p, it's a return fare 50p, that's 65,000. Now, whether that would interfere with the KCC concessions, I don't know. The 50 and the 82 would still be less than the return fare that other travellers are paying. But I, I don't see why they can travel free on the bus. Why should we be effectively subsidising them to use the park and ride when it's making a loss? And the risk is that the service is lost as a whole to everybody. So I'd just like to throw that idea out there as a potential 50p to the older generation for the benefit of using the park and ride. Thank you for that. Would you like to comment or just note that for now? 
Uh, I think a comment back is we did have a look at um, whether it's possible to charge a sort of a reduced rate for those using concessionary bus passes. And I think we found that we couldn't, but we'll look into it a little bit more as well, just to make sure um, uh, to see what we can find out on that one. If I might add to that, is this not where the concept of some element of charging for parking would run alongside a bus fare and the concession aspect? There would be another way of achieving that within the rules. We, we did look at a number of um, uh, scenarios in terms of charging, and one of them was charging a fare and splitting it a, um, across the, um, uh, the parking and the, um, uh, and the riding, essentially. That was right, wasn't it? Um, and we had a look at that, and it just didn't seem to be value for money. But again, we'll revisit that as part of the, the financial modelling. I, I know that there's potentially a very nasty VAT consequence associated to that, but there might be a hybrid where you could, you know, achieve some of what Council Mrs. Springer is suggesting. So, anyway, you, you've got a note of that. Uh, you're finished on that point, Councillor Willis? Well, I, I'm going to go around in order. He was in time. Okay. Um, very well presented, by the way. Very difficult thing to present quickly. Um, just to understand, would I be right in saying that um, it looks to me like we subsidise it by £30,000 a year? 584 minus 242 plus 218. I'm trying to. What? Sorry, my maths is awful. Right. Generates an income back 342. Park in 218 plus them together. That makes a difference of about 30,000. Is that. Roughly right, 35,000? No, I think if we, can I just ask that question? What, what do we subsidize, subsidize it by? And also, second question, the parking money that goes towards it can only be used for certain things, I think I'm right in saying. What are those things? So, two questions there. Clarification upon the, the net subsidy, which is 200 and something thousand, am I right in saying? You'll know exactly where the figure is in the report. So um, it's 242,000, you're quite right, um, 218,000 met from the Civil Parking Enforcement Fund, which um, on my potentially bad maths as well, I make 24,000, is that about right? <laughs> uh, but the 218,000 can be spent on other things um, and it can be used, and it's actually in that paragraph in 2.7, it's used to meet the provision and maintenance of off-street parking, uh, environmental or highway improvement, or in the provision or operation of public passenger transport services, which obviously includes park and ride. Um, as the comments of, of Mr. Member Perry, um, I think the reason why this is important, we've got to improve that. We've got to improve our park and ride, I think, somehow. Um, I do understand, I think, the comment about it being breaking even. I think in this situation, the austere situation we're in at the moment, I think that's a fair comment. Um, but the, uh, the, the thing is, we do have four, four or three AQMAs in Maidstone, which is why we need to look at a solution like this to reduce pollution. So I don't agree that it's a... You know, the car is the only answer. I'm not going to be anti-car particularly, but we need, we need a mix. An electric must come into this long policy discussion. Um, so the, about going out for tender, um, surely it's going to go to, it's going to be, it's going to coincide with the results of the consultation on Park and Ride. Would that not put, would potential bidders be able to still come into the process after they've seen the results of our consultation? Or are they locked out by that point? Well, we do have consultation, which we will put out there in terms, and, and the results obviously are shown in Appendix 1, and we will put that out there with the tender we're currently going out with. But when we go out for tender and we get the results, um, at that point, no other bidders can join the process. That is the process. Mm -hmm. Can you just clarify again, because I, I thought you said that the tender starts and then the results of the consultation come in. We have probably a month to the next SPST meeting where we discuss the, the consultation and vote on it. 
the, the, the results options in the consultation for park and so the separate consultation for park and ride that we that Mark's policy department are doing. Uh, well, my question is, if, that, if, that, if the results of that come back with something that's commercially, more commercially interesting for someone, such as another park and ride site, dare I say it, or, whatever, or something better than what we got, which is what I think we need, would they still be able to enter the process after that? Or, or can, more positively, can we find a way that they, we can leave it so people can still join in the process after that? Thank you, Chairman. I, th I think the first thing that I would say is that um, I will be working with uh, Georgia and Lisa to ensure that there is a synergy between the tri study, the, the parking, the park and ride, um, and the uh, bus interchange study, um, and the park and ride operational review. Now, there is a differentiation between these, these areas, although they will be joined. Um, the park and ride operational review was a much more sort of short term, seven to ten year time scale whereas the tri-study will be looking at a far longer term uh, primarily, you know, up to 15 to 20 years um, uh, as a sort of baseline, if you like. Um, I will ensure, and, and Georgia and Lisa will ensure, that when we are at the appropriate stage, we will bring that report, that joint report, together to SPS&T. Um, the aim is to produce that for October, but we will want to make sure that there are uh, that we have the conclusions, that we have the results of uh, all the research which is being undertaken at the moment. So it may be slightly later and so forth. I can't provide the, the, any reassurance, it would be for Georgia to answer, regarding the uh, tender and the bidders and that side of things, but I can say that we will work together to ensure that we come forward with that report at the appropriate time and integrating the results from both areas and both studies. But may I just pick up on that before I come back to you, Councillor Willis? So time scale is what you were referring to then and I think you were alluding to we may not necessarily be on course for getting the, the tri study together on the timeline suggested and we're going to tender now because of the expiry of the existing contract and I know there are complications of giving due notice to the parking commissioner and all those sorts of things if one conclusion were drawn over another so I am a little concerned as to whether the timescales that are laid out before us are actually workable to allow members to see a full picture and draw the correct conclusions, whatever they may be, in sufficient time to place new contracts, council existing, or whatever other option might be. I don't know if either of the officers could comment very specifically on how we weave those timescales together. I think I'll start, and then if Georgia wishes to say anything else, uh, then she will. Um, I thought we had a very successful member workshop regarding the tri study. I was really pleased, and thank you very much for everyone who took part in that. Um, one of the effects of that was that members were very keen to ensure that we undertook the necessary primary research, particularly around parking, to ensure that we had something meaningful from this tri study. Um, Officers have taken that on board and we, have, uh, we are uh, in the process now of uh, working with the consultants, WSP, who attended that workshop to ensure that further primary research is undertaken around the parking side of things. And that is going to add a period of delay, uh, a small period of delay to this study to ensure that we have the right work. So there will be a period not only for the data collection around parking, which of course we will want to do at an appropriate time when we go around to the car parks. We don't want them to be unrealistic in terms of unrepresentative in terms of what we're seeing, what the surveyors are seeing, but also in terms of the subsequent analysis as well. So there will be, I think, uh, rightly an inherent delay, and I think also that may uh, synergize quite well with the work which is going on the park and ride operational review, but I'll, I'll leave that to George to comment as well. Uh, well, I guess it depends uh, what the delay is. Currently, um, I think the um, report itself is on the forward plan for October. Provided we can meet October or November, we are still um, in line with the timescales um, uh, in terms of procurement and letting out any contract we might want to uh, going forward. So ideally, we'd have um, any contract awarded by the end of uh, November to um, give the operator time to get things in place. 
very, very little margin in that. Councillor Willis, I'll come back to you. Um, yeah, I, I fully support the good report you've done, by the way. I think it's, it's brilliant and obviously it shows the difficult problem you've got, the difficult tendering exercise you've got to go through. But um, I'll also point out that the planning inspector did also point out about some, made some remarks about park and ride in the end, his end report in the, in the inspection. I think he said he was surprised there weren't other plans. I'm really concerned that what comes forward in the tri study, as it's now called, I won't call it all the other silly names, could really make a difference to the commercial opportunity of a bidder for our park and ride. Is there no way that we could find a way of mirror, uh, what have you got, joining up the, the dead, the, not the deadlines, but joining them up so actually, you, I'll put, put, put it simply, can someone still join in the tendering process after, they, after the park and ride studies come to this committee and being voted on? Um, thank you. Obviously, you would have an opportunity to kind of get into a dialogue with the preferred bidder, wouldn't you? And they would be able to have that dialogue in the context of the, the tri study. So, I personally, I don't see that it's. Uh, um, I don't see that it would be a problem. Do you, Georgia? Can I come to Mr. Kitson? Um, if I could just um, uh, make a point, although somebody couldn't join the process after the tender process has, has been run. I think one of the key aspects that, that we need to address, I'm not suggesting it's easy, but one of the key, key aspects is to make sure that the tender and the specification allows for growth and it allows for innovation. Uh, and so if quite late in the day we do get somebody uh, or some ideas from the tri study that the scheme or the service should look something different, we should be in a position where the specification with the preferred bidder um, is something that is, is a little more flexible rather than the rigid process that we've got now. I was hoping you'd finish, but if you have one more point and then I'll move to Councillor English. Councillor English. Um, I think I share Councillor Perry's slight confusion as in terms of the recommendation one at least. Um, can I check, is there an extent committee resolution of the, this or other committees um, with setting out the decision to go to tender? I'll ask for clarification, but I think that happens under delegated powers. Who could confirm that? Mr. Cornell? Yes, um, so we, we, within the sort of delegated powers, we have the authority to go out to tender because there's, there's a previous decision that's been made to, to run the service. So. Nevertheless, for the avoidance of uh, confusion, I think that's what the recommendation one should actually say because it is unclear, because those people who are, who are n not au fait with the history of this would wonder why, uh, a decision, why the tender decision is simply a note without reference to the decision-making process, because it, it then creates uncertainty in people's minds. So I think there should be a reference in, in note one as to what the tender process has been and what the authorisation for that is. That's what caused Councillor Perry's previous confusion. And I, I think as written, it, it actually doesn't flag up how we got here and it, and it, do, it does actually create uncertainty in people's minds, but that's just an observation. Um, I actually think the use of notes in, in committee reports and this and recommendations is something that should be avoided, but that's another issue for another day. Um, what I would say is I don't, I think people are fooling themselves. It is not possible to run a park and ride service at break even or even close to it. What it is possible is to reduce the losses, but it is not possible on the size of park and ride service that we have in Maidstone, starting from where we are, to even approach break even. What we have to do if we're looking at this is to see what can be done to reduce the losses or what other alternatives in terms of providing public transport provision are actually going to work better? And I have an open mind about this, but I'm not actually absolutely convinced that if we've got 
income from various sources, planning obligations, seal, section 106, parking revenue, etc., etc. <coughs> that actually the existing or any or change park and ride system is the absolutely the best way to go. There are different options available. Where I would disagree with what's been said earlier elsewhere is actually there is quite there is adequate car parking in Maidstone, but not all of it is particularly usable. Take um, our own council offices uh, and the mall. There's car park to the rear of that that is hardly ever used because the signage is so crap, pardon my technical term there, that most, most members of public don't even know it's there. Go, go, go to uh, fourth, fifth or sixth floor of the council offices tomorrow, look out on that rear car park and see how many cars are actually in there. And that car park is perfectly usable, but because it isn't properly signposted or on, a, or on maps, it's barely used. And there are other car parks in Maidstone, so we need, to make, we need to think about making the best use of our assets. And I can tell you that one Maidstone has done a, a, quite a lot of work around the bid process, to, uh, and a lot of that's to do with car parking. And it doesn't tell us there's a shortage. What it does tell us is that our car parking space is not used in the most appropriate and useful manner in many cases. So that, that is a slightly different issue. But in conclusion, I would say that what we, sh what we, sh we shouldn't be looking at this as an ideological pro or anti-car. We should be looking at what works, and that's going to be a mixture of solutions uh, pragmatically arrived at and not um, an ideologically pro or anti position and we're not going to have a perfect solution but it's going to have to be what works and that means we are, may have to um, think a bit outside the box and, and I think that we are going to have to reconsider some, some of our policies that have been running in, in tracks for about 30 years because then they're not fit for the 21st century. I think it's probably very important to draw out a distinction there. You're referring to various car parks that are not under the control of this council or anything directly to do with us. And I think there's a perception, perhaps with the public sometimes, that we control all parking. And actually at least 50% of it is commercially operated and you know I'm not saying there isn't room for collaboration but it's a fiercely competitive market and the, the willingness to cooperate isn't always there yes mr. chairman but that is a very different issue than saying it doesn't exist and there is a lack of car parking per se what I would say is whether if it does go ahead um, the bid and arrangements for that um, do allow us an opportunity as a council to work with other people in looking at some of these potential solutions. And we should not forget that we don't have to do it all ourselves. Something I think that needs definitely to be fed into the element of the TRI study that relates to town centre car parking. I'll move on to Councillor Cox. Thanks very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I won't go back over what's been said. Um, I wonder whether there is any merit to looking at a five to ten year look at the tender. Because if we're looking seven to ten, there's not, I wouldn't have thought there's going to be a great deal of difference. But if people are trying to work a, a mix of, well, we should do this with the bus service, we should do that with the car parking, I wonder if there is the ability to say, can we have a look at your tender for five, seven, or ten? Is that doable, or is it just too far outside the remit of, of what's, what's plausible? Ms Hawkes, would you like to give an answer? Well, as I say, the tender documents are being worked on at the moment, and one of the things we're working on procurement with, with is um, how we can um, uh, understand whether there is a difference between seven and ten we think there might be we don't know so we're trying to build that in what well, we will build that into the tender try and work through thank you so is that a yes it will be a five seven or ten because if it is I'd like to change the uh, recommendation
I think the key word in there is approximately, but you, when we come to the recommendation, perhaps we'll pick that point up. Mr. Kitson. I think it's just important to, to raise one point. I think um, when you're looking at a, a contract that has significant investment in terms of buses, um, any operator would want to offset the cost of those buses over a long term. And so the reality is that over a shorter period, it's likely that the bid price is going to be much higher than if you had an offer over a much longer term. Can I just come back on that? Um, so are we assured that the stock that is therefore bought to satisfy our requirements would stay within our, requir with, within our, our field and that we would keep the same buses? Because the buses that seem to be coming in and out of Maidstone in various areas seem to be not as good as the ones that suddenly arrive in a certain area. Uh, in other words, the stock does change somewhat during uh, the life of, of the, the tenure. I don't know. I, 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 I can see what you're saying, Mr. Kitson, but um, yeah, uh, we, we would hope that uh, it's not going to be double the amount of money if we're saying we want to only be tied in for five years and not ten years. It was just so that it gives us more of an idea about different mixes that we could look at, which I think is really why we're asking for, the, uh, for the, the tender to happen, so that we have all the information which will robustly en enable us, after reading this report, to look at everything. I think what we quite clearly have here is what I'm going to call the dichotomy of good intent. Um, we've got an air quality working group that recognising older buses can be a very significant contributor to the problem. We therefore have an aspiration in this tender document that Euro 6 or whatever it is is where we should be. And that has a cost consequence which actually potentially undermines <laughs> the good work that Park and Ride could do to air quality. So, you know, we've got a, a, a shock of realism. Um, so I wanted to pick up on a couple of points that members have said. So Councillor Mrs. Springett made the comment which was something along the lines of got to keep supporting park and ride because any cars extra on the road are an issue. Um, and I think that probably alludes to the particularly the peak time congestion. So I've been thinking about this and trying to put that into context. Um, we I nearly said we think nothing of granting permission for X hundred houses, but regularly there are substantial applications that go through which deliver hundreds of more vehicles onto the road. And we've got to look at this cost in the context of, identified directly in the report, 170 peak time cars, you know, to put it in context. Um, Councillor Willis, I think, was, you know, trying to draw out some of the numbers and some of the costs. And being a bit of a simpleton, I go 200 and whatever thousand divided by 170, and you come up with an actual subsidy, public underpinning, whatever you want to call it, of I think it was £1,385 per year for each one of those vehicles that you're removing. And, and when we're looking at the context of, is this good value? for public money, then, then I think we've got to ask ourselves some very serious questions. When we considered sitting Bourne Road, I think we looked at 300 core users and a cost of £300,000 and thought it was fairly shocking value at £1,000 a head. Now we're at 13.85. So you know, I think there's lots of difficulties here. Um, I've been thinking long and hard about this. I am certainly not anti-park and ride, not at all. But we don't have one of those famous money trees. Um, I've written and asked for some seeds that we could perhaps grow, but uh, I've not had a reply yet. But, but we, we don't. Um, to get closer to a break-even point has to be our aspiration. I think Councillor Perry began to say this earlier. My concern is that we're on a bit of a binary choice path here. We know where we're at now, and it's shocking value for money. We're going to go for a tender of 
nice new clean buses, whatever innovation we can put into the service and then be faced with a decision of perhaps an eight, ten year commitment of it will be all right on the night, but I'm not feeling that. And it's a binary choice. You're almost like, we've got to stop now before it gets out of hand or we're going to run with something for ten years. And I'm just wondering if there's an in-between ground that we need to explore more thoroughly. You know, we're saying that there might be some different pricing models, charging models, that if we implemented it, it might help. And, and what I'm hankering after is, well, why don't we put that to the test before we commit to an eight or ten year term, perhaps? Um, and, and I think we were hearing earlier, there are perhaps some difficulties with the time scale of completing our tri study and trying to fully understand the whole issue in a holistic sense, that we could be at the point where we've either got to get into part two of the tender process or even get close to awarding tenders, which will, and, and members might walk away and say, no, I don't want to do that, it's too risky. I'm wondering if there's any way that we can buy ourselves a little bit more time in between. I think we've extended the contract at least once already, but you know, another six months, another 12 months, where we actually test some pricing changes, whether it's of the value that is ascribed to its users in this report, it's highly valued. Is it highly valued enough to pay another 50p or a pound and get us closer to a break-even point that would then give us the confidence with some innovation to consider a new contract, better offering perhaps? So I, I don't see that what we are asked to note by way of recommendations tonight suggests that, but I'm wondering whether members would like to put that to officers as try and take it away from being completely binary to let's get on and see if there's something that we could trial and test in the short term. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, we, we've got enough indications to do another round. I don't want to draw this out too much. Councillor English, you're saying it's directly on this point. Well, I'm willing if you want that to put that formally to the meeting just to formally second that. As Thank you, Councillor English. Um, very succinct points, then, if we go round again. Councillor Dewey. Look, I, I, where I disagree with Councillor English occasionally is, is where I think an invitation to tender is not a, is, is, is not a commitment to contract, and it's something I think we, that we could let officers do. It doesn't need to be a recommendation. Um, I think Councillor English is right when we say that we have to see, see what works. To be honest, I think the tri study is not necessarily for the, for the people who are tendering, it's to inform our own decisions. Now, if we can, if we can um, work and see what we can get some, some differences, some, some, some changes to see what things work, and if we buy ourselves time, then yes. Um, but I do think that, that the recommendations that we have here, that we actually ask for these tenders, because what we need to do, we, we do need to see what works. We actually need to see what these people are suggesting they're going to do. Lots of where, 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 where we can talk around all of these issues, what we'd like to do, what we, how we'd like to manage it. The fact is, we don't actually know what they're going to offer us yet. And I think getting that, getting a few of those ideas together, um, along with this trial study, would give us a real opportunity of saying, maybe this works, maybe that doesn't. And at the same time, doing, seeing if some of this charging works. I think, I think, I think what we need to do is get on with some of this. Um, and if we can buy ourselves some time, then excellent. I'm going to come to Mr. Cornell, but just picking up on what you're saying, you know, as a very basic business head, we're asking for a perhaps better, more innovative service. We're asking for new buses. Um, if I was a betting man, I don't think prices are going to go south on that basis. But, but that would be predetermining an outcome. But I definitely, well, let's see. Mr. Cornell. Yes, thank you. Well, all, all, all the issues um, sort of being discussed this evening, we, we did discuss at the corporate leadership team as well, and the, the timings are difficult. The current contract with Arriva actually expired 
in May of this year. So we took a decision to start this process off and we extended them for, for a further year. But obviously, were we to slow down and extend for another year, you know, that kind of perceived procurement risk becomes sort of weightier. So, you know, I would really encourage that we sort of go with the recommendations um, and, and we start the procurement process as suggested and um, we evaluate, you know, what comes back in the context of the, the tri study in the autumn. And if, you know, we need a couple more months of extension on Arriva from May next year, I'm sure that can be facilitated, but I would be concerned I'd, otherwise. I, if I may, I, I think you might be slightly missing the point of what I'm saying. And, and we do appreciate CLT's wisdom in this matter, like we do in all matters, but my point was there's some thoughts about changing pricing. Why don't we test them out with a very short commitment as an extension of the service before we commit to an eight, ten year contract? That, that was my point of whether there was a way we could facilitate a very specific trial. Um, I'm going to move to Councillor Mrs. Springett. Um, I'm not sure what time. Note three says that further consultation will be carried out to users and non-users. Picking up also on what Councillor Burton has just said, in that we, we sort of need to try it. I don't know when that consultation will be, but could we include in it questions such as, as the service is at risk because it is currently loss-making, would you be happy or prepared to pay £2 flat fee for off-peak users or 50p if you're a bus concession. So could we actually ask the question and just see, because I think if people, people I'm sure had no idea it is at risk of being curtailed because it loses so much money. And I think we need to put that out there and say, there is a risk it could be closed, but would you be prepared to pay more to keep it going. So I just wonder if we can somehow put that question out there if that consultation is going out or try it. I, I totally support what Councillor Yeah, we, we, we can ask the question or yes, why or not try it. just try yeah. it? Proof of the yeah. pudding and all that. Uh, yeah. Councillor Willis, were you wanting to come back? Um, first of all, can I ask a question, I suppose, to, no, to, to, to the officers or, 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 or Officer Cornell. Um, What's the kind of time scales of the tender process? It's not commercially sensitive to us, is it? it, it what, we've got until May or June next year with an agreement with Arriva? What's the, what's the date at the moment? Can, can, can I just rephrase that in case it helps? When's the deadline of our decision making? This contract that we have now runs out on a date. When is that? And when we, do we have to make a decision against that in the context of informing the Parking Commissioner. Mr Kitson. Um, the current contract runs out in May next year. Um, and looking at the timescales that we have, we need to be in a position to award the contract uh, around November time to allow the mobilisation uh, of any new operator or existing operator into the service. Does that give you the clarity you want, mm. Councillor Willis? I think that's really, I'm not an expert on these kind of things. I'm a salesman so on a smaller scale, but to me that sounds really, really tight. If we get some blue sky thinking, well, our, let's be honest, our park and ride is not doing very well at the moment. And Chelmsford, Canterbury, Cambridge, they all love their park and ride and they're well used. And I don't know the numbers, but they're a lot higher than ours. We, we're hoping that WS, the, the consultants come back with something that actually breathes some life into it and finds a way of making it actually take some cars off the road and reduce the health effects of pollution. So if we're going to that time scale of November, I know it's only opening the, as you described it, is opening the tender process. I just think we might be limiting ourselves a bit for a, a decision by November. Could we not find some middle ground to get an extension I know it's not for this committee to do that, but to get an extension with a reva, I'm sure two or three months to, to get to perhaps this end of December, end of January. Yeah, th that was the point I was making, really. Now, I don't think it's going to be disastrous if the decision's not made at the end of November. If we need another couple of months, we can extend a reva, I'm sure, 
not too controversially by another couple of months to the summer of next year. But what I would say is, you know, we need to start the, the tender process now. Otherwise, you know, we'll just be having these discussions, you know, further on. And then it will be a, long, a longer extension, and that becomes more, more problematic given we've extended once already. Can we just have the other dates? Sorry. Just thinking, can we just have the other dates? And the tender is due to finish on what date? And the tri study is due to, due to deliver on what date? Well, I, I still think we should work backwards from the fact that the contract as it stands ends in May. Were we going to close a park and ride? And I'm not saying we are. Is it six months' notice we have to give a parking commissioner? There, there's a notice period, isn't there? I'm sure it's a, uh, the traffic commissioner is 56 days for any right. change. So it's 56 service. days. It's not as bad as I thought, but they are the, the, the lines that are cast in the, in the rock, and unless we have an extension, we need to work around that. Now, I, I think we've had much debate, and we now need to just move this forwards. No, Councillor Willis. Um, can I take us all to page nine where the recommendations are set out before us? Um, and I think we need to take this one at a time by consideration. And, you know, if anybody's minded to suggest anything alternative. So, recommendation one is just to note that an invitation to tender for park and ride service will be published in July in light of the forthcoming expiry of the contract. Does anybody have a problem with that? We're just noting that as a fact. Okay. Let's take these one at a time. Well, we'll run through them and then we'll do the agreeing just in case something comes out further down that makes us wish we hadn't to that. So, Number two is, note the invitation to tender for Park and Road will request bids for a contract of approximately seven to ten years. Um, specify the need for vehicle, vehicles that meet Euro 6 standards. Explore the costs of other improvements to the service and encourage innovation from potential suppliers. Councillor Cox. I would like that to say from approximately five to ten years, please. Sorry, Councillor Cox, do you have a seconder for that as an amendment? I wasn't going to take it as an amendment yet. Let's just roll through what's actually written here just in case, and we'll come back to that as a formal amendment if we, we want it to. But there's a, there's a point that's raised. Note three, that further consultation will be carried out with users and non-users of park and ride regarding potential changes to the charging structure <laughs> and possible changes to the service. So my, my suggestion is that we consider the possibilities of a live trial of a different parking, uh, charging regime before we get to a tender. Not just asking people, but is there an opportunity to test a revised parking, uh, charging structure? Um, and then four, note that the results of stage one of the tender exercise should be known during September, reported to committee in October, coincide with the findings of tri-study, park and ride, uh, and allow flexibility around the future of the service. So I think there is concern that that time scale may not be met as it stands. So going back to the beginning, I think one we seemed content with to Councillor Cox, are you wanting to amend the words there very specifically? Yes, please, if someone will second me. And, and what do you, you wanted to say, five to ten. Yes, what please. about if we invited bids on a range of... Do you mean by saying five, seven or ten? Yeah, three, five, ten, perhaps even. So, sorry, Councillor Mrs. Springer. Yeah, I was saying, if, if you, unless you specify for each, each person that tenders to tender for those three periods, you're trying to compare 
unlike items, you're trying to compare someone for a 10-year period versus someone for a seven-year period. So I think, I think it might be easier if we asked each person that's tendering to tender for five, seven, and 10, because otherwise you haven't got a comparison yeah. table. So some specific durations, because even if we're comparing as it stands, seven to 10, one man's 10 is not another man's seven is a valid point. Yeah, I, I had five, seven, and 10 on yeah. my scribblings here, so is, I'm happy for changing. Is five our threshold? Do we want to go lower? Five's our threshold by the sounds of it. So, five, seven, and 10. Uh, Mr. Wells. Sorry, I think um, dealing with the procurement team, some uh, issues arose with regards to how we would actually phrase that in the form of a tender. Um, at the moment, as Councillor Springett said, we have to specify that it would be a 7 and a 10, and all suppliers would have to bid on both of those. Um, the way the tender is currently structured in a provisional stage is that all uh, suppliers would have to bid on at least two options. Um, so if you multiply that by the two-year options, you're then left with a minimum of four bids. If we then add the option to do 5, 7 and 10, uh, all suppliers have to submit at least six bids, uh, and incrementally, if we add three, five, seven, and 10, uh, all suppliers then have to submit a minimum of at least eight bids. Uh, and I think the fear from procurement was that it becomes so much hard work that it will actually start deterring suppliers from submitting bids. So I think we said that four uh, works as an optimum minimum. So what you're saying is it's seven or 10 specific at the moment? Currently, yes. Yes, which, which is somewhat more certain than this recommendation leads to suggest. So, members, are you content with that or do you still want to invite a five? If we'd have been told that there was a structure that people had to work to, are you saying that one company has to provide six different ideas to formulate a bid for a seven and 10 year? Or are you saying we need to have six companies to supply it seven and 10 years? That's a bit unclear, that's just. Sorry if I was unclear. Um, at the moment, the way it's structured is we're asking for two, uh, at least a minimum of two variable bids. Uh, they vary on frequency, so we're looking at exploring a 20 minute frequency option and a 15 minute frequency option. Um, the seven and 10 years, so that's two bids, uh, seven and 10 years then adds two variants to the two bids. So thinking of it as a table, you'd have row one, row two, and then column one, column two, a few years, uh, and it builds up from there. So at the moment, all suppliers have to submit a minimum of four bids. Um, for every year you want to add, or every column you want to add to that, it will go up in increments of two. I don't really see a problem with that. If you're doing a pricing spreadsheet, whether you're the, the bidder or the, the tendering authority, I don't see a problem personally. No, I was going Council to say, the if, Cox, if, it's if, your if, amendment. Well, to me, if people are going to go, oh, I'm not going to go that far, I'm not going to give them the figures for five, then what are they doing? It's a, I don't really think it's that much of, an, uh, of a problem. If it is, uh, I would have wished your wording to be, there is no way you shouldn't do that, rather than we're thinking it might be too much for people. So can I just have a final comment? Do you think it's acceptable to ask, or do you think it will deter people from actually giving us any bid at all? Uh, the sense I've got from the procurement team at the council is that a, increasing it uh, would deter smaller suppliers. I think the amount of work they would have to put in to supplying a tender they're not necessarily guaranteed to, uh, to be successful in would just make it non-viable for them to tender. I certainly don't want to preclude smaller businesses or smaller companies from doing this at all, but I really would like the information of what they reckon the plausibility and the feasibility of running a service over these. And if you think about it, we've asked Areva to extend by six months, a year, and they just go, yeah, not a problem. So. I, I would like to see it because I think people, I think other councillors, other members will go, well, isn't there another option we could lack it here? Looking at just on five years and then extending to 10, 
I think it's worth asking if possible. If I may, I, I wonder if we're pursuing a red herring here. If we're into park and ride and we're committing, whether it's five and ten is almost, well, potentially beyond any of our electoral terms. Um, you know, you, you're in for it long term at five years or ten years. It, so, your amendment, do you want to seek a seconder or leave it? I'm happy to leave it if it's going to deter smaller businesses from doing it. Right, so that leaves that one. A stands three was the point about further consultation and whether we ask officers to see whether a trial of different pricing could be conducted before awarding the tender. That's my suggestion. Mr. Corner? Um, I don't really feel like we've got the information to answer that one now, but my risk would be you're kind of changing the pricing structure, and then if you, then you let the contract, you change it again. So that would be my... I can see the logic of what's being suggested, but it might end up sort of complicating matters, given where we are at the time, because, you know, if you trial something and that doesn't work, and then you're you know, the impact on the users, you'll be changing twice in the space of a year. Not twice, once only, surely, because isn't it being suggested that we would look at changing the pricing structure anyway? And that what we'll be speculating as on when we come to decision making is whether that pricing structure is viable and whether we should take on a new long-term contract. I'm trying to put certainty to at least one of the sages before you have to make a double guess. That, that's what I'm trying to suggest. My point was that if the prices came back and they were less beneficial than we would have hoped, you might be having to make a, a second change. That would be the downside. I understand what you're saying. Right. I do follow what you're saying there. Councillor Wears. I would second you on that. Sorry to contradict the officer, but I think it's a good idea because I think I'd be quite confident they'd be set in a way where they'd have a good chance of working. And I think to get support across the floor, it seems to me like we need park and ride to be sustainable. Now, I don't mean the 200, just to clarify, I don't mean the parking money, I mean the, the, the 24k difference. Yeah. I, I can see that. That makes sense. So I, I do back what you say. I hear what you're saying, but I, I believe our officers will get it right. Well, the transport officers will get it right. Can we perhaps just add to this that officers give consideration to whether um, pricing trials could be conducted? We don't bind them to it, but we're given a clear indication that we'd like that considered. Um, Councillor De Wigginan's shaking his head. My only concern on this is, is at the moment we have the trial study, which is due to come to us in, on the 10th of October, so presumably that has to be completed by, what, well, third week in September. And to then to add um, new pricing trials in as well, so we'd need to actually decide what we're going to do, get that set, get that set up very quickly. Are we going to have that back in time and finish by the middle of September for the report to write for it to come to us on the 10th of October? That's the first question. Actually, is it, is it feasible to do that? Um, my, my, my concern was actually that we, we, we have this report in time for us to consider it in October. You're adding stuff to it, and, and we haven't even decided what, if, if we're going to do it, what kind of additional pricing we're going to do. I've just had another thought about this, maybe a way forwards, because we're being asked to note something but almost give some very specific um, uh, acceptance or encouragement to some aspects. Why don't we just say we note the report and ask for a further update at the earliest opportunity? Yeah? Because, you know, because we, we, I'd, I'd sense we're not 100% on board necessarily with this, so we should leave it to officers to go to the next stage and then come back to us. So if I may, from the chair, I move that we note the report and ask for a further update at the earliest opportunity. Seconded by the vice chair. Those in favour? I believe that's unanimous. 
Thank you. Agenda item 14. Uh, Mr. Wells, if I might ask you to assist us here. Parking Services Annual Report, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, every year, six months after the close of the financial year, uh, we are asked to publish a report on parking services to comply with both guidance from the Department of Transport uh, as well as local government, or sorry, central government uh, legislation on transparency. Um, this allows us to inform the public of what we're doing. It allows accurate benchmarking data, uh, which can show insight into the department's performance against key performance indicators. Uh, more importantly, it allows us to inform the public of what we do and improve the perception of parking as a service. Um, unfortunately, I'm sure many people know parking is not really viewed as a positive service. Uh, and I think across the industry, there's a shift to change that so that we are seen as service providers uh, rather than the current negative image. The Parking Services Annual Report can serve to do this by highlighting key projects uh, that the surplus generated through parking is used to invest in, uh, and also putting a spotlight on new products and services that are introduced by the council to improve the driver uh, experience. Um, it also allows us a chance to bust many pre well to break or clarify many preconceptions that people have about parking. So these are the, the sort of myths people have that they're on a commission basis, uh, they hide around the corners, they get their end of year bonuses and those sorts of things. So it really does allow us to just clarify what it is as a service we do, uh, what benefit we actually have, um, and how we're performing uh, in accordance to the targets that we are set. Uh, the next steps for the report are just that the report be published on Maidstone's website in the coming months. Um, but I would welcome any comments from members. Thank you for that succinct delivery. Councillor Mrs Gooch, you're straight off the mark there. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll work backwards, if I may. Uh, this was quite uh, an eye-opener, and I enjoyed reading the report. I am a sad person. Um, can I just ask, on page 51, the disabled parking, I was quite uh, interested to see the number of PCNs issued for no valid blue badge. Would that include people who haven't got them up the right way or the badges have dropped on the floor? Because I was wondering if there was something KCC could do to help us because they issue the blue badges, as I understand. So is there some information that you can help expand that for me? I have a few other questions, too. If I could just answer that one. Um, first of all, we do run um, particular uh, events, really, with KCC, where we get the blue badge team, sometimes the police, um, and we, we go and inspect badges. Sometimes we even seize badges. Um, through KCC if there's misuse. Um, there was some perception, which is why I've taken the, uh, the question, there was some perception some years back that penalty charge notices are issued if a badge is upside down. Uh, I vaguely recall in the press there was an awful lot of uh, uh, folk being upset that why can't the civil enforcement officer just twist their head sideways. It's not upside down, it's back to front was always the issue. All the important information that we needed to see, such as the expiry date, was face down. So under those circumstances, yes, we would issue a penalty charge notice. Um, but of course, the appeals procedure allows us then uh, for the driver to then provide us with a copy of the badge that then allows us to, to, to see the reverse. Things have improved since. We now have direct contact through to KCC's Blue Badge team. We're hoping to improve that in the future with further development from handhelds and things. But the numbers, I, I agree, the numbers are quite high, but it, I think it just goes to show, unfortunately, the amount of uh, misuse uh, and abuse uh, of inconsiderate parking in disabled bays, both on street and off street. May I continue, please, Chairman? Thank you. Uh, a couple of minor points, actually. Uh, on page 41, the first paragraph there, um, can you just put drivers, because it says, to maintain highway safety for both dryers and pedestrians, and I had visions of hair dryers and spin dryers and pedestrians in the street, so forgive me, that, that's mine. I'm sure you can stick a V in there in the appropriate manner. Um, 
I would, I do note though that the picture is of ex-councillor Stephen Payne, great councillor. So I'm really sorry he's not back in. But anyway, the point is that he was cabinet member. We're now under a committee system. And first of all, do we have his permission to use his photo? And secondly, would it be appropriate for an, an ex-cabinet system to be promoting something which is now under a committee system? Oh, I bet Clive English would have been proud of that comment. Because I'm nitpicking, forgive me. I think uh, so. So the fact that my picture's at the front, and I once was a cabinet member, but now I'm a committee chair, probably excludes me from both opportunities, does it, by that logic? Yes. All right. Um, I, I think it's a fair point to make. Uh, I'd just like to clarify that the typo about dryers uh, was previously identified, and that will be corrected when the report goes out. I think a couple of other small... Uh, F finicky is good in our books. Finicky gets things right. But I think uh, a couple of other small typos were identified and a couple of formatting errors, but they will all be addressed by the time the report's published. Um, the photos as well were put in. They were all obtained just through the public realm. Uh, but if, to be fair, we can change them, uh, and I think there's probably a look to update them because uh, even in terms of image quality, they're quite low. So I think we would look to replace them anyway with something of higher quality before the report is published. Thank you, because that would I, give the report uh, even, uh, even more professional look, because otherwise it's a good report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll leave that to officers' discretion, I believe. Um, and I, I think the important thing about seeing this report is to just be mindful of the information and the report in the background as we're building up to these ultimate results from the TRI study consideration of parking, bus interchanges, bus hubs, park and ride. I just think it's useful for us to have it on our radar from every angle at the earliest stages possible. So thank you for bringing that this evening. And if I may move from the chair that we note that report, that noted. Thank you, members. Which does allow us to move forwards. Agenda item 15. I chose to ignore them so we can move on. Um, <laughs> and moving on we are to agenda item 15. Um, planning performance statistics. Um, and this is being presented by Mrs. Arnold. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I will do quite a quick run through as statistics probably speak more loudly than I do. Okay. Um, can I just also draw members' attention to the urgent update, which yes. has been circulated? I don't think you need time to study it too heavily. It's a table of comparatives which gives context to the report. Sorry, back to you, Mrs. Arnold. Okay, so the intention of bringing this report is um, a similar one to the previous um, item, actually. It's about um, increasing our transparency in terms of volumes of applications that come through the service, um, the sort of workloads that officers um, deal with, um, and really giving you councillors a good oversight of exactly what sort of the department deals with. Um, so, running through, um, the intention was to bring these reports quarterly um, to committee. One question I will have at the end is whether you wish these to come quarterly or you'd rather an annual report. Um, so running through very quickly, this data um, covers a number of different work areas. So it picks up validation and sort of the applications that come in through planning support, um, the determination of applications and development management, and also picks up areas such as Section 106s, which overlaps with um, Mid Kent legal services. So turning to um, 2.7. We'll start with um, our pre-application service, and if you look 
at Appendix 1, it sort of shows you the sort of volumes we have coming in, um, particular focus on our pre-app majors where we see the greatest um, value in terms of efficiency in terms of determining applications later. Um, it gives us an opportunity to provide sort of up-to-date policy um, requirements um, as well as allowing us to process applications more efficiently. Um, on to planning applications and determine information. So this um, is in Appendix 2. It demonstrates the volume of applications that have come into the service, and this is where I would refer you to the urgent update, which shows majors into Maidstone benchmarked against other Kent authorities. Um, you'll see here that not only has Maidstone received the largest number of, well, has determined the largest number of major applications of any of the Kent authorities, it also sits as one of the highest in terms of percentage determined within time. By some margin um, in terms of applications determined. Um, moving on through um, planning appeals. So again, we've drawn your attention to these because 1617 uh, saw um, a high number of appeals by comparison. Um, we have above a table for 1516 as that's our current data available for comparing to other Kent authorities. Um, but you can see Maidstone obviously receives one of the had received one of the highest in 1516, and we've seen an increase in 1617. So we had 90 when, 91 appeals heard um, in 1617, of which 67, so 74% of them was dismissed. But obviously it represents a, a high demand on officers' time, um, as well as potential costs. Um, enforcement, so again, this is, um, a good news story, we saw 26 um, formal actions taken last year, which by comparison to previous years has shown an increase. Um, although, obviously, what I have tried to do in the report is pick up areas for improvement as well, and we'd want to see a continued um, increase in formal action where relevant. Um, and then picking up on section 106s as well, um, you can see at the end of 1617, we had quite a large number of open cases. It's an area we've worked closely with MKLS to deal with. Um, and for quarter one, we're now down to um, 18 outstanding section 106s. Thank you for that introduction. Very good. Councillor Mrs. Spring. Thank you. Um, I've got just a couple of questions, two separate questions. Um, one is on um, the planning appeals. Obviously, we've got a high level of appeals, and you're saying we're one of the highest authorities with appeals. When do we apply for costs? Because obviously, we're losing money on this. It's, we have no control over appeals, yet it costs us money, and it seems very unfair. So is there a, a particular uh, benchmark for we'll apply for costs on this one or not, or do we apply on every appeal. Mr. Jarman, if you would. Yeah, you, you, um, the local planning authority can um, apply for costs, and I often have, um, but you've got to prove unreasonable behaviour. And that's the test. In the white paper, um, although it's had a frosty uh, reception from the de development industry, um, in the white paper, there's a proposal to charge for appeals. It's, uh, whether or not we would get any of that money from the planning inspectorates, a um, different matter. Thank you. And, and the second question was, on enforcement, um, paragraph 2.19 makes the comment, um, enforcement teams see high numbers of cases reported every year, but after investigation, many of these result in no further action taken because it is found that no breach has taken place. Um, is that because we just say, oh, you should just submit a planning application? Because that's what 
I've been told, oh, we'll just ask them to submit a planning application. So I just wonder what, what constitutes a no breach? In my experience, what can uh, constitute a no, no breach is that we get um, a lot of complaints um, about what I regard as fairly um, minor issues, like one neighbour says, my neighbour has put up the fence, which is um, 1.8 metres high. Um, no breach because there's permitted development rights to put a fence up in the back garden up to two metres, so there's no break. But the complaint is still being registered. A case, um, an enforcement officer will have gone to the site and checked that the, the fence is below two metres. Uh, Councillor Springett, and a, a lot of um, complaints nu numerically aren't about actually um, planning breaches. They're about environmental health or, or, or just sometimes no um, regulations are being broken. I'm going to come across my right this time um, so I don't miss you. I do apologise for that last time, but we'd closed the item before I spotted you. Councillor Willis. I was just going to compliment our parking department originally. Um, uh, I don't mean to be, I don't want to use a rude word, but a, a, a bum, but that's the wrong word. Um, I don't mean to be a git, as I was about to say, sorry, and I apologise, but, but, but the, the question from a financial, I'm really concerned as how financially we are as a council. And the question that uh, Councillor Springett asked about um, claiming costs when we win an appeal, I think that's the right way of putting it. Not, let's not talk about particular appeals, because some of the, But if there is one where the, uh, the developer, is that the right word, has been, and this is a question across the planning, that, um, where the developer has been um, unreasonable, are we actually, and I think there might be an example, potentially, that's out there at the moment, that's probably still out of question, but are we have we got the resources to claim, get our legal services department to put a claim in? Because we're talking about a three-figure sum, including barristers' fees and things like that. So they claim it from us, we're always told, in planning. So is, that's a question for one of, any one of your officers that want to ask. Mr. Jarman again. Yeah, um, as I said, um, I'd expect a planning officer to put forward um, um, a claim um, uh, regarding unreasonable behaviour. Um, at, at the start of an informal hearing or a public inquiry, um, an inspector will say, um, uh, are either party going to um, apply for costs? And that's the time to flag it up. But it's, um, it, it's basically about, um, and as I said, I've done it with um, appellants, is basically argue that they haven't been able to justify their case, therefore it's been a waste of public money. But, as Councillor Springett um, alluded to, that's a tiny fraction of appeal costs. Um, on any appeal, regardless of costs or not, and employing barristers, um, there's a substitution cost, even on written representation appeals. Um, basically, the more time my planning officers are dealing with appeals, the less time they are dealing with planning applications. So it's kind of like dead money, if you like, if I was talking as a businessman. So can I ask, did we do that? I'm not, you may tell me there's a reason. If you can't comment on it, don't, because it's still an outgoing, a slight outgoing issue. But at the beginning of the fan, farm but planning appeal. Can I recommend that we don't mention any specific cases? Okay. Perhaps you Have we done it recently? Have we actually said at the beginning of the appeal, because I've been involved in the appeal process and it is arduous and expensive, and I hate the fact that if we, I'd like to think that we're, we're always told on planning they'll claim against you. So I, have we done it at appeal? In, I've been a councillor for nearly three and a half years, three years. Have we done it in that time you've been... Sorry, I can't recall at a public inquiry... I can certainly uh, recall um, informal hearings. Uh, informal hearings, they're much, you know, the scale of the development in front of the inspectors, much smaller. But um, perhaps I didn't articulate the point. Um, on unreasonable behaviour, on, uh, as you said, Chair, I prefer not to um, go into specifics, but 
perhaps I'm generalizing too much, um, housing companies will get barristers to represent them. They, they'll usually, usually have a team of agents, not just planning agents, landscape specialists, highway um, engineers. Personally, I think it's very hard to uh, say that the appellant um, hasn't justified his or her case because they've got a whole raft of, of evidence. And personally, if, if I may, I think tactically, at the start of the inquiry, it, it isn't always the best idea to almost kind of blindly apply for, for costs on unreasonably, unreasonable behavior. But, you know, there's lots of different types of appeals. I've dealt with sort of single houses in the countryside where, and, and I can think of officers who've also done the same, where basically um, the appellant hasn't been able to demonstrate there's the justification for overriding good old policy ENV28, ENV and the inspectors agreed. So certainly that's key on members' minds is that the consequences of a appeals of the costs and I think we're reassured that whenever we can get money back we get money back but what we must see here is the number of appeals and the pressure that that places on officers and actually flicking through the report there aren't many annual comparatives where it's gone down by way of volume the workload is colossal the pressure on income is clearly there um, so I think it would be fair to note actually the success of officers with with what is presented here and you know I, I, it's only one table but you know we don't look too bad when you actually you know stick your head above the parapet and compare to other local authorities um, so I think with the committee's agreement we, we would note the, uh, the good work that's actually contained within this report and that we yeah I for the minutes, not by way of summing up, um, and, and we are cognizant of actually the workloads that are upon officers. So I think we dealt with Council, Council Mrs. Gooch, you were next, and then I'll come back to, to you. Thank you, Chairman. Trouble is, isn't it? With data, I always think, it, how does it go? Lies and damn lies and statistics and diddle -a -diddle -a -diddle, whatever that is. However, when it comes to planning, it's not that long ago that we had complaints of developers saying, oh, we take so long processing planning applications. It's not that long ago that planning, the uh, planning support team went through hell and Tunbridge Wells withdrew from the planning support. It's not that long ago that we've, we've had Section 106 difficulties, legal difficulties. This is a bit like Phoenix rising from the ashes. I think this is really, really fantastic work. It really is. And the chairman stole my thunder, actually. But I really do think that the planning department, notwithstanding the review that's been going on, put that to one side, put the local plan to one side, if ever we can. Um, I really do think that these statistics speak volumes for the hard work that officers have done. And I just think it's very important that this committee formally thanks Rob Jarman and his team, and that's all parts of your team, whether it's enforcement, the spatial planners, we've had, a, and the turnover of staff that we've had in the past, and yet here we are looking at this report. Well, I think this is something we've got to be really proud of. Thank you very much, and I would like that minuted. I'll second that. Julie, it can be. Councillor, Mrs. Pendergast. Thank you. Um, yeah, I do. I, I'm really pleased to see this report. It's, it's really helpful. And um, you'll be surprised to know that I'm not going to dwell on enforcement other than to say I don't know anybody in my ward that has a perception of the service being a positive one, but that's just my ward and I'll leave it to that. Can I just ask about heritage landscape and design, please? It would be really nice to get a breakdown because it's the heritage element has always concerned me. And we're talking about trees and tree preservation orders in the same 
sentence or in the same paragraph as, as heritage and knowing that we've had problems in that department I personally would like to have seen some sort of breakdown between the two rather than uh, you know thrown into one So just taking on board what you were saying there, uh, I think Mr. Jarman can arrange to circulate a little bit more additional detail on specific. But, but I think in what you're saying, um, you know, we're looking at some very good work here, but there are enormous pressures as well. And, and I think perhaps in picking out heritage and landscape. So we've got a service with a massive workload. We've got a council in the context of there's not as much money this year as last year. Um, and I think it's very important that we've got a good understanding of, of what the issues are when we consider future resourcing. If there's no one else wishing to speak, um, aside of all the, the good comments which will be captured in the, the minutes, can I ask that uh, we, we note the report? Is that noted? Thank you, members. Sorry, um, at the beginning I did ask whether anyone had a view on whether you'd like this to appear quarterly or um, annually. I... Chairman, if I may, I wouldn't want to put, we, we do need to be aware, sorry I speak as a sub obviously, I think this committee ought to be aware, but on the other hand, as you've rightly said, there's an awful lot of pressure on the service and I don't think that we should be trying to put too much uh, extra burden on the team. Let's, I, we, I think we trust certainly them. we don't want reporting for the sake of it. And, and perhaps you would leave that to chair and vice chair discretion. You know, if we sense that there's information that needs to be reported, then we'll bring it forwards yeah. rather than insist upon a, a regime of is there every quarter, whether we want it or not. Is that agreeable? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, final item for this evening, uh, agenda item 16, uh, Brownfield Land Register update. Uh, Mr. Watson, would you be kind enough? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, local plan authorities are now required to have a Brownfield Land Register covering the area of its local plan. The requirement is set out in the Town and Country Planning Regulations 2017 and the Town and Country Plan Order 2017. The requirement to produce a brownfield land register came into force in April 2017 and requires local authorities to have a compiled register by the 31st of December 2017. The purpose of a register is to encourage development by providing consistent, up-to-date, publicly available information on brownfield land that is suitable for housing development irrespective of its planning status. To ensure that the 31st of December deadline will be met, work has commenced on the Council's register. This work has been based on the requirements set out within the regulations and will be reviewed if necessary when the guidance is published. Uh, it is expected that detailed guidance on the Brownfield Land Register will be published by uh, the summer of this year. The Brownfield Land Register is in two parts. Part one is a comprehensive list of all Brownfield sites in the local authority area and that the local authority considers suitable for housing irrespective of their planning status. Part two of the of the register is a subset of part one and will include only those sites of which the council has decided have permission in principle. The grant of permission in principle will settle the fundamental principles of de development including use, location and amount of development for the brownfield site. Development on a site with permission in principle cannot proceed until technical details consent has been obtained. The grant of permission in principle for sites in part two of the register has the potential to speed up the delivery of brownfield sites, but it will take an element of control away from the council as those sites will no longer be required to apply for outline planning permission. There is also a potential loss of income um, in the process uh, that would have been gained from the outline application fees. However, a fee will still be required for technical details consent. Sites suitable for housing led development can be entered onto part two of the Brownfield Land Register only after they have followed the consultation and publicity requirements and procedures set out in the regulations. And further, that the local authority remains of the opinion that permission in principle should be granted on those sites. 
Officers are currently in the process of reviewing whether any of the sites proposed for part one of the register could also be potentially included in a part two. If the outcome of this review is that there are sites available and considered suitable for inclusion in part two, these sites will be presented as part of a report to this committee in September. Local authorities are required to update the information relating to each entry and review the sites on their Brownfield land register at least once a year. On review, any sites that no longer meet the criteria must be removed from part one and if applicable from part two. During that review period uh, process, the local authority may carry out any procedures they see fit to assess the current status of the sites and must take into account any representations received on them. Sites for housing development on the Brownfield Land Register Parts 1 and 2, which are considered to be deliverable, can be counted towards the Council's five-year and 20-year housing land supply. So to conclude, the Brownfield Land Register will provide a comprehensive source of information to developers on the available Brownfield sites for housing development within the borough, and Part 2 of the Register has the potential to provide a new source of housing supply that could further increase the Council's five-year supply position and provide more certainty to the windfall allowance in the middle years of the local plan. Councillors are asked to note this report. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Councillor, Mrs. Springett. Sorry, I'm having a busy evening. Um, I appreciate it's nothing that the, the council can control, but I'm really, really, really concerned that land in built-up areas such as private residential gardens and then it goes on to say that they're looking at, they expect to see local development orders being used to get permissions in place on over 90% of suitable brownfield land. How, how, as a planning authority, can we prevent virtually every large back garden in the borough from being put forward for development? Because nowadays houses are built with tiny little backyards and little postage stamps, and there are properties around that have lovely gardens. It's part of our heritage, if you like, and I can just see this destroying that, and I think that's quite sad. I just wondered if there's any way we can, how we guard against every Tom, Dick and Harry putting their back garden forward. Mr. Watson, is a garden a brownfield site? Um, I can confirm that a garden is not a brownfield site, so it would not be a part of this process. I think some will find that reassuring. Council Mrs. Gooch. Thank you. Uh, so why does it say, oh, there it, it, it excludes private residential gardens. Uh, I read it wrongly. Um, can you clarify my understanding? Uh, the next point down of the exclusions in paragraph 2.2, land that was pre previously developed, but where the remains of the permanent structure has uh, have blended into the landscape in the process of time. Could, I can't envisage what that means. I'm sorry to be thick. Can you give me an example, please? Yeah, I'll try and give some clarity. I'm not sure if I can give a specific location example, but it's where the actual land is almost returned to a, a, a different material state to what it was, um, so that it's no longer effectively uh, in a material state of brownfield land, so it's, it's on to a greenfield, if that makes sense. So, for like example, a line of hot picker huts that are now just a mark in the grass, would they qualify? If they were literally just a mark in the grass, um, yes. But I argued, uh, I don't know if um, councillors remember the Veglios Motel just to the north of Junction 6. I argued that because the Veglios Motel was no more, and apart from partial foundations, you wouldn't know that, that that was not a brownfield site anymore. An inspector disagreed. So taking what you said, Chairman, it would literally have to be a mark in the grass. I have one more question, if I may. Purely for clarity, uh, where the land is deliverable, you're talking about on par paragraph 2.7, sorry, where land is deliverable, the word that I'm more familiar with is viable. Uh, are they interchangeable words in this instance? Because that's the one issue with brownfield sites for developers, isn't it? It costs them far too much to develop, which is why they love greenfield sites so much. 
So I'm, I'm a bit uh, where the land is deliverable. Can, mm, can you just help on that one, please? Um, well, there's a definition of uh, what's deliverable within the report. Um, <laughs> it's underneath uh, paragraph 2.20. Mr. Jarman. We often get into arguments, basically, with um, house builders about uh, whether or not a brownfield site is likely to come forward in the next five years, uh, in particular. And like Stuart alluded to, um, often we say that um, we've done some calculations and the site is viable for residential. What they tend to do is contact the landowner and the landowner has a letter saying, "This, I am not willing to part with this land, so it's not deliverable, even though it's still viable. Jump in the queue, but you seem in... Go on. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can I just come back to the, the, the mark and the grass business? Okay. So if you have an agricultural building and you're looking at permitted development rights, for instance, there was some sort of um, case law earlier this year, last year, that said, you know, it's, it's got stricter, hasn't it? So you have to prove that, you know, you have to have sides and you have to... Wasn't there? Am I correct? I'm sure somebody mentioned it to me recently. Um, agricultural buildings, farm buildings, aren't normally uh, regarded as uh, brownfield. They're an exception, even, even if there's a mark in the ground or not. Sorry, I'm just reading Annex 2 of the MPPF defines brownfield land as, and then it says, oh, this excludes. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Right, that's a useful clarification. Councillor Willis, I think you were really next. Microphone, if you could. Um, two questions, if that's all right, and then possibly a third one or a comment. Um, this definition, is this the definition of Brownfield site, effectively, that in MPPF Annex 2, which is the 2014 version? Is that roughly? I'm not that well trained on planning. But okay. Um, all right. Has there been any change with this, with this is it legislation, with this dictate, dictate from government, which may, may be good? Um, is there any change tied in with it to the definition of brownfield land, apart from Annex 2? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, not that I know of yet, no. There's been no change to the definition as a result of this. Um, can, I, can I ask the head of planning, how, how, do you, f this register will, will streamline the process for developers Thing, to look at brownfield sites and make it obvious where we're trying to encourage development without any extra government money to go in towards helping cleaning up those sites, do you feel that this actually will make a minor or a major, no difference, minor difference or major difference to trying to get some, the, the few brownfield sites we had to come forward? My understanding is that um, this has come about from... Um, uh, lobbying by house builders and you know I think paragraph 2.4 sums it up the cost saving for from a developer is not put in a planning application and you know there are relatively large costs it's not it's not so much the, the fee for the planning application it's the ecological survey the transport modeling the air quality assessment, the heritage statement, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's usually teams of consultants that have to be assembled to submit planning applications. Very succinctly lay out the process, if possible. If it's on the Brownfield site register, is that right? And say, for example, a developer wants to put an application in, I didn't see if it's the size of housing development, but a reasonable size application that would get 106 money and things like that. Could you just, you may have said this earlier and I didn't catch it or read it in the report, but 
the basic process they would have to go through to put an application in and get detailed permission as well. Um, yeah, the basic process, you have part one of the register, which basically identifies all the suitable brownfield sites, but it doesn't grant them uh, permission in principle there. Um, but then, as a council, we would then look at the sites which haven't got any planning permission so far and then decide whether or not they're suitable to be moved into part two. If they go into that, then they're granted uh, permission in principle, but they still have to, uh, the developer still has to apply for technical details consent, which will look at things like infrastructure provision as well. It, if I might just supplement, so let's take an example say Springfield site, big brownfield site essentially, had that been in the register, had there been a register at that time, would not have needed to have sought planning permission? Um, if it had been put onto part two of the register, that's correct. It wouldn't have needed planning permission. It wouldn't have needed to put forward as an allocation either. It would have had PIP granted. Quick one and then Councillor Cox. So a site that has become ecologically uh, more attractive, such as Bridge Nursery, that's been built now, I think we can talk about that. If that come forward onto this as a brownfield site, and I, don't, I wasn't a councillor when that was given, but, but if that come forward onto this as a brownfield site, does that mean there wouldn't need to be an EI, environment, EIA, is it? Environmental impact assessment done on that site? I don't, I don't know the answer to that, because as Stuart said, one of our difficulties at this point in time is that the government haven't provided any detailed guidance because uh, I thought, Councillor Willis, you raised a good point. Um, I wasn't envisaging um, if a site gets on, like Springfield, like if it did get onto the Brownfield Land Register, my interpretation to date is that we couldn't ask for Section 106 contributions. It's very much a sort of technical tick box exercise that you you know you've done the high level stuff because the whole p point is to streamline the planning process related yeah yeah um, well this silly question but this report will come back to this committee for discussion and a, a vote is that right uh, the intention Sorry. The intention is to bring the report back in September, so we will have a detailed part one of the register, which is just for noting and publication on the website. If we've, uh, after review of a number of sites, decided there are sites that are suitable for part two, they will come back to this committee for deciding whether or not to take to consultation. And presumably, we're not getting any extra money for actually doing this work, creating this register? Um, that, that's right, yes. In, on in the, that, but yeah. it might be somewhat more than that in its true cost. Uh, it's hard to say possibly, yes. I mean, the, the loss of uh, application fees, it, you know, the cost will be more okay. than what we can. Councillor Cox next, and then Councillor De Wigginen will have the last word. I feel like a brief interlude in the James Willis evening, but um, if I can, uh, <laughs> um, I think having this sort of information that's uh, available to the public uh, will also give the planning committee uh, the ability um, to look around for potential sites that could be used, am I correct in saying, for 106 provision for possibility for open spaces or pocket nature reserves, because one has been found, uh, I believe, in Bridgeward, um, and would that have been on the register or not been on the register? Because do you know the, the site I'm meaning? Right, behind the... I don't think piece. we should get too site-specific here. Well, it already is an actual site. So I'm asking whether <coughs> it would have counted as a potential brownfield site. I, I mean misunderstood you. I thought you were speculating. No, 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 I'm not speculating. So it, it actually is a pocket nature reserve. But what I'm, I'm really alluding to is, if we have a register, um, the question was asked earlier, when does a brown field become a green field over time? Because if you watch Time Team, there were lots of things. Around. Um, so realistically, uh, at planning summer school about five years ago, this was a big topic. 
Yeah, could you offset a brownfield site, turn it into a greenfield, into um, to a woodland or a nature reserve, and then look at it as offsetting somewhere that had much better transport facilities, transport provision and uh, accessibility? Is that a possibility with this register? Uh, I think that would go beyond the scope of the register, yes. Councillor de Wigginen, the last word is yours. Thank you. Um, what this seems to highlight, I mean, it's a, it sounds like a significant loss of control and possibly a significant loss of income um, as well um, for the, 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 the benefit of these sites you now being included in five and 20 year land supplies um, a year after we've needed it. Um, one of my things is we've actually spent a lot of time over the last, in the last decade actually using up brownfield sites. And these, all, all, of, all of the boroughs are now going to have to have these lists. And I can see the way that the, this is written, that the government's expecting you to get uh, permissions in place on 90% of them. They're also going to come back and go, um, you don't seem to have very much allocated on your list. You, we're, we're, it, I, I'm, just, I'm just concerned that we're actually, you know, it's, it's, it's yet another stick to beat you with to actually say, your brownfield, look, brownfield list isn't very big. Um, why, why not? And that's, that'll be another thing in the future that a, that a government inspector will want to help us out with. I, I think it's very valid what you're saying. I think Maidstone has, has historically delivered well on brownfield sites and now we're subject to the blunt end of an instrument designed to cajole those that haven't. Mr. Jarman, the final, final wrap-up. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Being more positive, <laughs> we, we, ha we have allocated uh, numerically quite a lot of um, brownfield sites. I think it's picking up on your point, uh, Councillor De, De Wigan Dean, we need to prove to developers and planning inspectors that we're delivering on these brownfield sites. Not at any costs, but we do need to get them away, in my opinion. Otherwise, there will be this carrying call for more greenfield re release. That being said, um, we're asked to note this statutory requirement for the council to prepare and compile a brownfield land registered by the 31st of December of this year and uh, to note the steps that are being taken to ensure that the deadline is met. Is that noted? Thank you. That concludes the agenda. Uh, my thanks to everyone as usual for your participation and your patience and your cooperation, and I'm happy to announce the meeting closed. Thank you. <laughs>